that Brother Cook preached when I came forward to become a member of the body of Christ. I remember Brother Fisher baptized me, washed away all my sins. I was 13 years old. My sister and all my friends in the congregation had been baptized a year or more longer than me. But I always remember something my mother told me. She told me once, don't come up there to get baptized if you don't understand why you are a member of the body of Christ. Don't come up there if you truly don't know why there's only one church in the Bible. And it took me a little time to put it all together. So I didn't get up when a lot of my friends and sister was getting up. I stayed in my seat way back there in the back. Eating chocolate cookies doing service. Used to be a little store across the street. When they started service, we used to sneak across there and get us some cookies and open the package and empty them into our coat pockets. Sit back there in the back and eat cookies all doing service. So I knew I wasn't ready to become a member of the body of Christ. But I'm thankful. And it's always good to be in my mother's presence. Because I know whatever good is in me, if it had not been for God and her, it would not be. My wife is present. I don't ask her to stand because she don't like to stand. But most people know who she is. And then our traveling partner, our grandson, John, He's been traveling with us long before he can even walk or talk. Amen. We pretty much take him almost everywhere we go. My subject, and I'm going to give you my subject before I read. My subject this morning, becoming the true body of Christ. Amen. Becoming the true body of Christ. I want to thank Brother Jordan for reading the scriptures that he read. I'm only going to read one scripture of what he read, and then I'm going to get into my lesson. And I also want to thank Brother Frazier for asking me to stand here in his stead and for the leadership, the brethren, for agreeing with him. It would be okay for me to stand here. Even though this feels like home, I won't take that for granted. Mm -hmm. But Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. The Bible says, and they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now I may deal with all the scriptures that Brother Jordan read, 
But I only need that one to say what I intend to say this morning. Peter was preaching the first gospel sermon following Jesus' resurrection and ascension back to heaven to sit on the right hand of the Father. That day, about 3,000 souls responded and were baptized and was added to the 12 who was already in the kingdom. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 confirms that. In Acts chapter 4 and verse number 4, how bid many of them that heard the word believed, and the number of the men were about 5,000. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 14, more added to the Lord, multitude, both men and women. I believe this morning that if we study the first five chapters of the book of Acts and we closely look at the picture that's painted by God in those scriptures, the church in the mind of God is what we see before all the trouble arose in the church. What makes the church so special? What qualities did they have that we should cultivate in order today that we might be great men and women in the kingdom of God? Look back closely at Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. The Bible says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What does it mean to be steadfastly? It means to be unwavering, complete, and firmly rooted in the doctrine of Christ. The English Standard Version of the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thanksgiving. See, the world believes that there's a multitude of faith. But the Bible teaches us plainly that there is one faith, the faith. And if we don't hold on to the faith, we can't be like those Christians that were baptized back in Acts chapter 2. Because the Bible says that they were in the faith. That's what they were baptized into. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 4 says there is one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. I heard a preacher once preach that text, and he preached it from verse 6 back up to verse 4. And his reason was that because when it all started, it was already one. But Paul had to emphasize to the Christians what one was in order because it was already drifting away from one. The apostles' doctrine. It is that which Jesus taught while he was here on earth. It is that which the Holy Spirit brought back to their remembrance and revealed unto them. It is the gospel of Christ. Remember what Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 teaches us, that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes it. To the Jews first and also to the Greeks. But therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Even Jude 3 says that we should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The problem is that many of us today are not contending 
for the faith. What do you mean then? I mean, many of us were allowed to be drifted here and there. Many of us are holding on to stuff, are cleaving on to stuff that has nothing to do with the body of Christ. Many of us are spending too much time in front of our TVs, in front of what Oprah is saying, and all the other Dr. Field and everybody else are saying, and we're gauging and planning our lives by what they say instead of holding on to the faith. I don't have a problem with psychiatrists or psychologists because I believe they play a role yes. in this world. Yes. But if you pay close attention to what they do, yes. they don't solve your problem. Right. They help you to understand how to deal with your problem. Yes. But if you hold on to the faith, God can solve your problem. Yes. The Bible teaches us, take it to the Lord and leave it there. God can fix the problem. God can move the problem. God can heal the problem. Psychiatrists and psychologists do a great job, but they can't take the problem away. And sometimes we don't need to know how to deal with it. We need God to move it out of our way. That's why you have to hold on to the faith. But some of us are so easily removed. Yeah. Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 6, it says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. For there is some that trouble you and will convert the gospel of Christ. But though we be as be an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you that which we were preached unto you, which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. Yeah. Yeah. What Paul was simply saying, there are some that's going to come along yeah. and they're going to tell you some stuff that ain't in here. That's right. That's right. And you, if you're like me, you see it every day. Yeah. There have been gospel preachers that started out as great gospel yeah. preachers. But now they've drifted off to the left or to the right. Now they're telling you that it's all right. You don't have to be baptized in the watery grave of baptism to be saved. They're telling you right now that you don't have to sing with your voice like God commanded us to sing. We can bring in some instruments to help us to be able to do what God told us to do with our own body. They'll tell you that any church will do now. You don't have to walk into the body of Christ where God said we should be. You can go anywhere you want to and God will save you. See, that's what it means when there's another gospel out there. And the problem we have is that it's not that the world is teaching something different because they've always been teaching it wrong. The problem we have is that we now are starting to teach it different. And we got a whole lot of people are drifting away from the body of Christ because they're not engaging in the word, they're engaging in the man. And if you're sitting in this morning and you're amazed and marveled because I'm standing here, you're here for the wrong reason. Because I'm just human. And I'm subject to make a mistake. But you, you stick with the word of God, no matter what I say, you'll still be all right. You, you hear those stories all the time. And I grew up here. If that if you was in a boat, and everybody in the boat yes. was wrong. Yes. Are you going to get out the boat in the ocean with the sharks? All right. You can save your soul in the boat. No matter how many wrong folks is in the boat. But you got to stop looking at them and look to God from where your strength and your help come from. Man can't save you. The church can't save you. The church can help you, but it's Christ who does the saving. And if Christ don't save you, you won't be saved. But you can't be saved outside of the church. So what you gonna do? You 
got to stay in the church. Years ago, I asked my mother, why do you stay? And my mother told me, it don't matter what's going on. You got to save your own son. And when you read the Bible carefully, your soul is in your hand. But go back to verse 42. Notice in verse 42, not only did when they step back in the apostles' doctrine, but the text say they also they fellowship. Biblical fellowship means that we share something with one another. Yeah. If you're without something that you really need, and I share mine with you, we have fellowship. But now if you see me in me and you walk on past me, you don't have no fellowship for me. The term also means that we share in our emotional experience. We share in our pain. We share in our troubles. We share in our losses. We share in our joy. We share in our happiness that we have here on this earth. This is what fellowship is. This fellowship allows us to mourn with one another. It allows us to rejoice with one another. But when you are jealous because your brother and sister have stepped a little higher than you, that's not fellowship. When you are envious of your brother and sister in Christ, that's not fellowship. When you are trying to tear your brother and sister down, that's not fellowship. When you walk out here and you get in the middle of that parking lot and you start talking about Brother Woodard because of something you don't like, that's not fellowship. And we're guilty of that. There's a congregation in this brotherhood that ain't guilty of that. Brothers will sit in business meetings and then walk out and rediscuss the meeting outside in the parking lot because they didn't like what the preacher said. That ain't fellowship. Fellowship is a participation in an effort and a work with a purpose to accomplish. True fellowship must include God. Yeah. Now, I'm going to step on your toes now because, see, my mother probably don't want me to say this, but I'm going to say this anyway. All of y'all that's sitting at home on Saturdays, when there's two or three out here at the pantry and there's 200 cars lined up and them two or three trying to serve all the food that needs to be served, but the rest of y'all at home watching your TV, cutting on your yard, washing on your car, you ain't part of the fellowship. As many people are sitting here right now, you ought to be running over each other to get out here on Saturday to help feed the neighborhood. That ain't fellowship. And I ain't going to take it back because I tell them the same thing at Fidelity. When you at home and I'm at that building, you're not participating in what's going on in the work of the Lord. You're not fellowshipping with one another. See, if all of us come together, the load is lighter. But when they start passing our praises and patting on back, everybody get included. You know, for the last 25 years, I've worked with the Texas State Youth Conference. I've served as the chairman of the board, the president, the secretary, the treasurer. Right now, I serve as the event coordinator. But what we do with the youth conference, that is a committee of about 26 people that's supposed to be working. Mm -hmm. Basically, there are about seven or eight people that actually work. Mm -hmm. But in order not to hurt nobody's feelings, mm -hmm. we just include everybody mm -hmm. when they start passing out thank yous. Because mm -hmm. you don't want nobody to feel bad. Mm -hmm. 
but in the body of Christ. Yeah. Sometimes you need to make us feel bad. Because yeah. right. we ain't doing all we need to do for God. Amen. And some of us are just so relaxed in yeah. the kingdom. Amen. We just come to church on Sunday morning. Yeah. Well, and you know, the, the, the saddest thing about the pandemic, it forced congregations to close. And it forced congregations, when they start opening back up, they slowly open back up, and they only doing one service. So y'all are so glad it ain't for one service. Y'all know what to do. <laughs> I didn't come to metal, but it just in First John chapter one, verses five through seven. This is the message which we are heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness. We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his sons, cleanse us from all sin. Why did you read that text? Because if we're in sin, well, let me put it this way. If I'm in sin, yeah. I can't have real fellowship with God. Yeah. And if I'm in sin and can't have fellowship with God, I really don't have fellowship with you. Yeah, we have to live a righteous life, which simply means to live right in order that we have fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. Yeah. First Corinthians chapter three and verse number nine says, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. We should always wanna have fellowship with God. When you're sitting at home, on Lord's Day, yeah. and they didn't open the church back up. Yeah. Right. And I'm talking to you, those of you that's not here that's on this live stream. Yeah. You're not having fellowship with the rest of the brothers and sisters. Right. You might be singing at home, but you ain't singing with the rest of us. <laughs> and the Bible teaches us that we have to come together yeah. on the first day of the week. You may even be taking that communion at home, but you are not in fellowship and relationship with the rest of us who are here taking it. Yeah. Because see, when we take it here yeah. as a collective group, yeah. that group that's over in South Africa, when they're taking it, we have fellowship with them too. Yeah. Even though you don't know them, you never see them, you never talk to them. But when the body of Christ takes the communion on the Lord's day, we have fellowship one with another, and more importantly, we have fellowship with God. Amen. But you know what part of our problem is? We're looking for credit for everything we do. When members of the body of Christ stop looking for credit, yeah, yeah. and just do yeah. we'll be moving closer uh -huh. to what they were doing in the first century uh -huh. of the church uh -huh. fellowship is Christians belonging to one another uh -huh. Romans chapter 12 in the verses 4 through 5 for as we have many members uh -huh. in one body uh -huh. and all members have not the same office so we being many of one body in Christ and every one member, one of another. Here it is, church. Others can sense if we love one another. You, you don't have to tell nobody in this audience if you love one another. Others can tell 
if you have honor one for another. Yeah. Others, that's not even members here, right. can tell if you care for one another. Yeah. They know yeah. if you are encouraging or edifying one another. Yeah. They know when you're talking about one another. Yeah. Behind the back. Oh, yeah, they know. Yeah. Because one thing about gossip, yeah. it spreads. Yeah. And if it's some good gossip, yeah. gossip yeah. it'll spread across the brotherhood. Yeah. They'll know what's going on here, not only over at Fidelity, but they'll know it in New York. Because oh, yeah. gossip spreads. Yeah. Yeah. So they'll know. They can see yeah. if we're kind and tender hearted. Mm -hmm. yeah. They can tell yeah. if we have peace with each other. Yeah. Oh, and they can show tell yeah. if we're forgiving yeah. for yeah. one another. Yeah. See, some of us mm -hmm. are acting like Christians. Yeah. But people, the world can tell yeah. if we're truly. God's people. Yeah. You don't have to wear a sign you on your back for folks to know who you are. You can be in a grocery store and folks will know by your demeanor, even if you have any kind of relationship with God Almighty. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you been in a grocery store and you were standing in line and the person in front of you Male or female, it don't matter. Didn't have enough money to purchase everything that was in their basket. And you're standing there because you're mad because they're taking so long digging down in their purse for pennies and nickels and quarters trying to get groceries. But did you just reach in your pocket and say, I got this for you? Because you are a Christian. Yes, and there's a person that's in need. Yes, now I come to tell you, if all they got in their basket is Budweiser, I'm going to stand there. Yes. But if they got food in their basket, they trying to feed three or four children that's hanging on to them. I'm going to help them out so they can get what they need. I ain't standing in line frustrated because it's taking them so long to get through the line. I, t I tell, I'm at Fidelity. You know, I love Kroger's. Yeah. My wife kind of, she's in, kind of in love with AGB, but I love Kroger's. Yeah. Kroger's is hot, but I just love going to Kroger's. And I go to Kroger's sometimes two or three times a week. And there'll be times I just walk around in Kroger's and I don't even get nothing. I just walk around there and look. And what's new in Kroger's this week? Yeah. But when I do purchase something in Crow, yeah. I very seldom, I have to really be in a hurry, but I very seldom go through the self-checkout line. Yeah. I'll stand in, I don't care how long the line is, I'll stand there and let them check me out. And I had a manager in Crow that asked me once, sir, I can take you over here in the express line. I said, no, ma'am, I don't mind standing here. And she asked me, why, sir? I can get you over here, there's nobody over there. And I said, I don't really mean no harm. But I'm going to tell you like this. Kroger's is hot. And I understand that. When I come in Kroger's, I have to push my own basket. I have to pick out my own grocery. I'm determined that somebody in Kroger's got to do something besides me. And the least y'all can do is check me out. You got to have patience in life. You got to, we got to have patience to deal with one another. You got to have patience to deal in with relationships. Husband and wives have to have patience. And I understand she has patience because we've been married almost 44 years. And we couldn't have stayed married that long if she didn't have some patience with me. Because I know me. I know all about me. And I know the good and the bad in me. So it had to have some patience on her part to put up with me. And we got a 13-year-old grandson that think he's ours. I remember when I was 13, 
I remember when my three kids were 13. And as old as we are now, you got to have some patience to deal with him. You, you, you just can't deal with him any kind of way. Because he ain't like his mama. He ain't like his uncle. He ain't like us. But you got to have some patience to deal with him. Because he's his own individual. But you got to get him to understand what's right and what's wrong. Amen. The first century church, they cultivated spiritual growth. I'm not going to read it, but you read it on your time. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13 through 16. These verses teaches us the church is a place of growth. Not just growth by numbers, but spiritual growth. We don't just help lead people to Christ. We help them to grow and to mature into Christ's life. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. What is Paul talking about? When you look at the characteristics of Christ, those characteristics ought to be in us. I had somebody to ask me, what do you mean when you keep saying to be like Christ? Christ was about love. Are you about love? Christ was about peace. Are you always maintaining peace and striving for peace? And when you see that there's some confusion, are you the one that help them to find peace? Christ was about meekness. Are we meek in spirit toward one another? Christ, you read it carefully. Christ was a praying individual. How often do you pray? And I ain't talking about every time you got a plate in front of you. I'm talking about showing up praying to God. Sometimes you pray so hard the tears just run down your eyes. Because you realize the troubles that's going on in this world and in your life. Do you pray for them brothers and sisters who have drifted away? Are uh, you just talking about them on the phone with other members? I, I, I knew she was going to leave. But are you praying for them? Are you praying for all the gospel preachers that have stepped away from the foundation of the truth? The Bible says to separate yourself from them, but the Bible also said, teaches us to teach, love them as a brother. Yeah. It doesn't say cast them away. You got to keep praying for them because God may change their heart and bring them back. Yeah. And when he bring them back, we're supposed to accept them back. And, and, it, and it troubles me when brothers and sisters come back to the body of Christ and they've been gone for a long time. We want to put them on probation. The Bible ain't said nothing about no probation. If the brother stands up and asks for forgiveness, then you're supposed to forgive him. And if he can pray, let him pray. But we make brothers sit there for months on months. But we're trying to watch him. God ain't told you to watch nobody. Let God be God all by himself. God knows a man's heart. God knows a woman's heart. Let God deal with us. God didn't tell me to judge nobody. God told me to receive them back with love and meekness and do everything I can in order that they may be come back and stay back. Amen. Do you believe God is calling you? And I'm talking about those of us who are members and those of us who are not. Do you believe, members, that God is calling you to a greater faith? That God is calling to a deeper commitment. Yeah. That God is calling you to a greater reverence in worship. Yeah. 
Do you believe that God is calling? Because if you believe God is calling you to do more than what you're doing now, you need to get that straight with God. And everybody, not me, I know me, but everybody in here know themselves. And you know what your relationship is with God. And you know if you need to do more. You know if you need to give more. You already know if you need to pray more. You know that. I don't have to tell you that. And if you're not a member of the body of Christ, you know too. You know that you need to give your life to God. And you can't just put your hand on nothing and hold your hand up in the air and say, I received it into my heart. Because it don't work like that. You've got to come to Jesus. And the only way you can come to Jesus, you've got to go down in the liquid grave of baptism for the remission of your sin. And the Lord would add you to the body of Christ. Amen. Open your Bible. I'm, I'm going to read two scriptures. And then I'm going to bring my lesson to a close. Go back to Acts. Go back to Acts. Acts chapter 2. And look at the very last verse in Acts chapter 2. Verse 47. And notice what it says. Praising God and having favor with all the people. I'm going to stop right there. The part that's where it says and having favor with all the people as Christians, yeah. we're supposed to have favor with people that's outside of Christ. Right. You ought to have favor with folks on your job. Yeah. You ought to have favor with folks that you just meet on the street. Uh -huh. You ought to have favor with people in your neighborhood, yeah. your next door neighbor. Yeah. You ought to have favor with all these people. Because they ought to be able to see God in you. Whether, whether they become members of the body of Christ or not, they ought to know that you are. And they ought not be guessing, because you ought to be able to tell folks that you are a member of the body of Christ. Some of us won't tell nobody nothing. But see, on my job, those folks know that I'm a member of the body of Christ. My sister, Principal, he don't even believe in God. And he generally makes fun of me, but he knows where I stand. Because I don't hide it from him. And I tell him all the time, I'm praying for you. And I am every single day. I pray for him. I, I understand why he do what he do, because he don't know no better. But that ain't that ain't for me to deal with. That's God gonna deal with that. All I can do is pray for him. And then look at the next part of that scripture. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. When we do our part, yeah. when we live like we should live, yeah. people will come to Christ. Yeah. But when we don't do our part, yeah. we're standing in the way yeah. of somebody losing their soul. Yeah. And you see there all the time we sit there, well, you know, they soul ain't gonna be required at my hand. If you stood in somebody's way, they soul gonna be required in your hand. And if you were so afraid, so fearful, that you couldn't tell folks about Jesus, they soul gonna be required in your hand. If you didn't live right in the presence of people, their soul is gonna be required in your hand. If you talk any kind of way on your job uh -huh. in the presence of non-believers uh -huh. as well as believers, uh -huh. right. and it hindered those people from finding Jesus, uh -huh. their soul is going to be required uh -huh. in your hand. Uh -huh. I'm going to read one more scripture. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter. Ephesians chapter. You got time, because I know Brother Frey to preach longer than this. <laughs> I'm gonna let y'all go, let y'all out early. <laughs> but 
But when you get to Ephesians chapter 3, and you should read all of this, but I, I won't take that much time to do that. But I want you to drop down to verse number 8. Good. And look what it says. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I don't know. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been here in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. What is the purpose of the church? The church is the saving place. All right. The church is where the saved come together. Amen. Jesus put salvation in the church. The church. Amen. It's the redeeming place. Yeah. You can't be saved outside of it. If you're going to be saved, you have to be in it. Yeah. But the church also has a deeper responsibility. Yeah. That responsibility is every time we live right. Yeah. Every time we do what the church is supposed to be doing because of the will of God in heavenly places, yeah. in the yeah. spirit world, yeah. they see yeah. the yeah. manifold wisdom of God. Yeah. There's stuff down here on earth folks are supposed to see because of the church. Yeah. But when the church is being the true church of, the, of Christ Jesus, even in the spirit world, Amen. they see the Amen. manifold wisdom of God. That's why we have to live right. Amen. That's why we have to love right. Amen. That's why we got to do all that we can do according to the will of God because you're trying to save them here on earth and you're trying to make sure in the spirit world that they understand what God is all about and that God has all power, that God's will is what's going to be done, that God can save the whole world because that's the problem that the world got down here and that's the problem they have in the spirit world because they can't understand how God can save the whole world in one body. But God is God all by himself and God can save the whole world in one body. Because it ain't about this building. It's the spirit of God. It's the spiritual world that God is dealing with over and over and over again. And if the church do its part, the spirit will know the power of God. So are you doing your part? Yeah. Am I doing my part? Yeah. That not only here on earth, but even up where the spirits from, yeah. they can see yeah. the manifold wisdom of God. That's why we have to be the spirit. That's why we have to grow more and more every day. That's why we got to stop sitting at home on large day. Amen. Doing nothing. That's why we got to teach our children every day the importance of moving them, leading them to Christ Jesus. Children don't grow up automatically wanting to be a member of the body of Christ. You got to teach them that that's what they want, that's what they need to be. But the Bible says, though, if you teach them when they get old, they won't depart. They won't depart from it. They'll come back. It don't mean they won't stray away. Yeah, right. I've been in the church all, almost 50 years. I've strayed away, but I found my way back. Because she taught me what it meant to be a member of the body of Christ. And I remember when, it, when I was doing what I shouldn't have been doing, my conscience revealed it to me that you got to get back over here where you need to be. Because see, if your conscience don't work on you, at some point, God going to give you over to a reprobate mind, which means God going to let you go. The 
this morning, if you're in this audience and you're not a member Amen. of the body of Christ, Amen. God is asking you yes, through his word, God is asking you, come unto me. Oh. Everybody that's heavy late, he said, come unto me. My yoke is easy for birds. Jesus is waiting to save you. All you got to do is come. The Bible teaches us that you have to hear his word. You've heard a portion of it. If you're sitting there waiting till you hear all of it, you ain't going to never become a member. Because you ain't going to never hear all of it. But the question is, have you, had, have you heard enough to know you need to be saved? Yeah. And if you're outside the body of Christ, you need to be saved. Yeah. You got to believe it. You got to believe it with all your heart that the body of Christ is the only place that you can be redeemed. You have to believe that. And you should believe that so strong is that that's what motivates you to want to repent and make that confession. The same one the eunuch made in Acts chapter 8 that I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. Yes, sir. If you're willing to make it down here in front of this Lord, mm -hmm. Christ will confess you before the yes, Father, yes, which is in heaven. Yes, and every one of us, I don't care who you are, mm -hmm. every one of us every single day need Christ talking for you. Yes, yes, yes. I'm so glad he's talking for me. Yes, every day. Every day. He's given a word to the to the father's ear. Give Michael another chance. Help Michael over yeah. this earth. Lift him up when he's torn down. God is Jesus is talking to him every day. And I don't want him to ever stop talking to him. But then you got to be willing to submit to water baptism. Why? The baptism is for the remission of your sins. No, it's not that. Well, I ain't looked back there, but I'm almost sure that water's pretty clear. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ain't nothing in it. Yeah. God didn't tell you it was going to be nothing in the water. Mm -hmm. It's by faith yeah. and your obedience to the will of God yeah. that you come in contact with the blood in the water. Yeah. No, it ain't going to be no blood coming up in that water. It's by faith yeah. that you believe with all your heart that Jesus' blood is going to cleanse you yeah. from all your sin. Yes, sir. Read Colossians chapter 2, starting at about verse 11. I'm not going to go there, but it says God performs an operation yes, when you go down right. in the water. God cuts sin away from you when you go down in the water. And the Bible teaches you in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, you come up a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things are new. All things are passed away. When you come up in Christ Jesus. But God, and God is, God is not asking you to come down here and tell everybody what you've done. God already knows. God just wants you to have a repentant for heart for what you're guilty of. And then he'll take care of the rest if you're obedient unto baptism. And those of us who are members of the body of Christ, you know where you stand with God this Amen. morning. But God is waiting on you. He's waiting on you to get it right. All he's asking you to do is to repent with a godly, sorrowful Amen. heart. Amen. See, some of us repent when we get caught. Yeah. That's not repentance. That's an admission that you got caught in something. Amen. I didn't ask you to wait till somebody down here catch you doing something, yeah. coming out of some house you should have been in. Amen. God is asking you to repent for that happens yeah. and get your life right with him. Right. Because he's the only one that can really forgive you. Yeah. 
And some of you, you're holding on to stuff that happened 25 years ago. You, don't, you ain't speaking to somebody that you ain't spoke to in 25 years. Some of you have family members that you won't even talk to. And you ain't talked to them for years. But you're going to carry all that stuff into the judgment. And then you're going to have to listen to what God is going to pass judgment on you when you could have got that stuff straight down here. Why you got a family member that you won't speak to? It don't, God don't care what they did to you. You got to forgive them even if they don't never say I'm sorry. Some of us waiting on folks to apologize to us. Folks ain't going to apologize to you. Folks walk over you in the store all the time and don't never say excuse me. You can't be walking around in the store holding that in. Let that go. Just don't you walk over nobody and don't say excuse me. This is my message this morning. I'm asking you. I'm begging you. Give it to God. Come now. Come now as we stand together and say. Without you, Lord, without you, Lord, Lord, I can't make it, no, Lord, without you, Lord, without you, Lord, without you, to wonder 